What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Blank Cast. In this podcast, we break down the word to discover truth for our daily walk. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Blank Cast. Here for part number eight of the Sermon on the Mount series. And guess what? In two weeks from the day this releases, the season finale, season one finale of the Blake cast will be available to listen to. It'll also be the final part of our Sermon on the Mount series, part number nine. We're coming to a close. We're coming to the end of this year, this season, this series. I'm so excited to dive right in again today. But before all that, please, if you enjoy the Blake cast, please share this podcast with five of your closest friends and tell them to send it to their friends as well. And also, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to or watch us on the YouTube channel. Just search my name, Blake Mario. You'll find the YouTube channel that has the video version of the Blake cast. Subscribe in both places. Please, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, comment down below, tell me what you think. And without further ado, I just want to go ahead and jump right into this. I know some of these have been long-winded, so I probably need to hurry up a little bit. <laughs> But here we go. We're jumping right in. Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 6, again in the New King James Version. We're going to read one verse to start. And it's an interesting one. we got to dive in to really understand it. Matthew 7, verse 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Very interesting verse. And if you remember from last time in our last episode, we were talking about how we ought to judge people as Christians. And it should be after we've already judged ourselves and we should always, again, judge ourselves harshly, then we judge others more harshly. And we need to fix our faults before we try to fix someone else's. But then all of a sudden, after all of this, it talks about not giving what is holy to dogs and not casting pearls before swine. And if you're like me, you read this and you're thinking, what does that have to do with anything? But when you begin to look at it in context, it actually opens things up and it gives you better understanding about this, you know, going to your brother and helping him fix his fault. So if you look at this, and I'm going to give you point number one, we got to look at this in context first so you understand where I'm coming from with point number one. You're coming off of talking about going to your brother, getting the speck out of his eye after you've taken the beam out of your eye. But it's saying, in this process, do not give what is holy to the dogs. Dogs were dirty. They were unclean. Nor cast your pearls, something valuable, before swine. Again, something pure, something valuable, throwing it into something that is unclean. Lest they trample them under their feet, And turn and tear you in pieces. So they cast it before dogs and swine. Unclean things. And it's going to come back to bite you. And so when we're looking at this. It's talking about this restoration process. That you've went through with your brother. Not to do it with somebody else. So point number one today. Is restoration is a gift from God. Don't waste it. We have to understand that this process of restoration, trying to restore a person after we've repented and we've allowed God to restore us, to begin that process of restoration with a brother is very important. But when we're talking to an unbeliever or somebody who is not willing to take proper constructive criticism 
from a brother in Christ, we're wasting our time. When we try to restore somebody and bring somebody to a place where they're convicted of their sins and their faults, and they begin to repent and pour themselves out to God, ask for forgiveness and turn from their ways so that God can now restore them. If they don't want that, if that's not what they're looking for, then it's not going to work. We're wasting our time. And so it's like God wants us to restore. In fact, it is our duty to restore. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. We are supposed to do that, but it's got to be somebody who is willing to do it that's willing to let God convict them of their sins, repent of their sins, and be restored by God. But if that is not something that they desire, if it's not something that they want and value, they'll trample it under their feet. And in fact, it often comes, comes back to bite you because you say, well, you're just judging me. You're, you should just let me do what I want to do. You need to just let me live my life, live my truth. And they come at you and they tear you to pieces. All because what you wanted was restoration. But if they don't want the restoration, you're wasting your time. It's like casting what is holy before dogs, casting pearls before swine, casting something of value, something that's pure. Restoration is valuable, it's pure. But if they don't want it, if they don't value it, they'll trample it under their feet. And it'll come back to bite you. So point number one today is restoration is a gift from God. Don't waste it. And speaking of gifts, that's what we're going to keep talking about as we continue in this passage, verses 7 and 8 of Matthew chapter number 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. What is God trying to say to us here? Point number two today is you have to pursue to possess. So we're coming off this idea of restoration, restoring your brother, and now not wasting your time to give something that is a gift from God. Restoration is a gift from God to us. But we come off of that and say, okay, now that you've repented, maybe you've helped your brother. We're getting our hearts right. We're getting focused on what God wants. Getting our value system in line with his value system. Serving God before serving the things of this world. Seeking God first. All of this stuff that we've been talking about. And saying, now ask and it shall be given to you. It has to come first in this whole topic of getting our hearts in the right place that we finally get to a place where we can say, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Our hearts must be in the right place and then that's when God can begin to give us these gifts that we desire. But he can never give what we have not pursued. Because before there is a giving, there is an asking. Before there is a finding, there is a seeking. And before there is an opening, there is a knocking. If we don't pursue the things of God, if we don't pursue the blessings of God, if we don't pursue what God has for us, then we'll never receive it. You will never possess what you are not pursuing in your life. And so we're getting our hearts right. We're getting our value system in line with God. And when that happens, God will begin to give you things that you value because your values are in line with his. When your values are in line with his values, the blessings begin to come because what you view as a blessing is truly what you need. What you view now as a blessing is really just the provision of God, what he has ordained for your life. When you get in line with his value system, that begins to happen. When your heart is changed 
and pointed toward him. That begins to happen. So now that I asked, it will be given because my value system is already in line to receive what God has for me. When I seek, I'm going to find it because I'm in line with what God wants me to find. When I knock, it will be open to us. Why? Because our value system is in line with his and now he can give us the good gifts that he desires for us to have. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And we can have it. We can be blessed. This isn't prosperity saying, well, you'll have all the wealth in the world. Because the blessings of God, they're beyond that. They're beyond just the surface things, just what we have in this world. But the rewards in God are so much greater. And when your value system is in line with his, when you begin to ask, the things that will be given to you are so much greater than the things of this world. When you seek the things that you'll find will be so much greater than what the world has to offer. When you begin to knock, the things that will be open up to you, the doors that will be open in your life, hey, maybe it's not a high-paying job, but it's opening up to what God wants you to be in. And so point number two today is you have to pursue to possess. And as we're talking about these good gifts, we must continue on in verse nine. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts, to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Mm. Point number three today is God wants to give you good gifts. And we've already talked about in Matthew chapter number six about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things being added to us. Those things that are needful to us. But God doesn't just want to provide. He wants to bless beyond what provision is necessary. But sometimes it's not what we think blessing is. In this society, we think blessing is wealth. We think blessing is money. We think blessing is cars and houses. But blessing goes beyond that. There's spiritual blessings. Things that you can only experience through God and not the pleasures of this world. So every good and perfect gift comes from above and he wants to give them. God wants to give us good gifts because what father would give a stone to his son who is asking for bread? Again, I've said it several times in this podcast. Over the past several weeks, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He's not going to give a stone for bread. If earthly fathers won't do that for their sons, why would the heavenly father be that way? Or if a son asks for a fish from his father, would he give him a serpent? No, no. Even people who are evil, who are so far from God and sinful, and they can give good gifts to their children. So how much more does our Heavenly Father want to give us good gifts? And again, they may not be cars and wealth and houses and all kinds of stuff. Because you know what? That stuff will fade. But the gifts that God gives, they're good because they're not temporal. They're eternal. They're things that we can carry with us. They're things that will go with us from this life to the next. The good gifts of God, those are what we need to seek after. The good gifts that He has for us. Because He wants to give them and I believe today that God would bless your life if, again, we would begin to ask him for the gifts that he is wanting to give. If we ask, it shall be given. 
If we would seek, we shall find. If we knock, it shall be open. Those good and great gifts that God has for us, we need to seek the gifts of God. So number three today, God wants to give you good gifts. God wants to give you good gifts. Believe that today. He wants to do that in your life. We're going to read verse 12, and then we're going to have our next point. Verse number 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. And so again, we're talking about the heart. We're talking about, you know, treating others the way we want to be treated. And so we kind of have this pause here. We're talking where we were talking about how God wants to give us good gifts. And it's surrounded by restoration in our relationship with our brother. So it's interesting to note that our relationship with our brother surrounds really how our relationship with God will go. Because if we can't have a good relationship with our brother, how are we going to have a good relationship with God? But if we surround our relationship with God with good relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, then the blessings will be poured out. That was just free. The point number four today that we get from verse number 12 of Matthew chapter 7 is Scripture supports the golden rule. The golden rule. We've heard it all of our lives. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Whereas it says here, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. A lot of this, the teachings of Jesus, if we really were to break them down, a lot of the teachings of Jesus in regards to our relationship between each other it comes down to just treat others the way you want to be treated. And he kind of op- he opens this chapter, although, of course, this is one big sermon. But when we look at this chapter, it opens up with Jesus saying, the way you judge is how you will be judged. So now we've looked at faults and how that, how we need to address faults within each other. But now it's saying, do good so that they would do good to you. Don't judge others so harshly because then they'll judge you harshly. You have these two different sides. One's a little more negative, one's a little more positive, but it all comes down to the same point. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Do unto men what you want them to do to you. And in fact, Jesus says here, that this very point is the law and prophets. So everything that we learn about between the relationships between men, if we would really understand all of what the Old Testament and even the New Testament, even though Jesus is talking about the Old Testament here, if we take the whole of Scripture, we understand that our relationship between our fellow man is a relationship of treating others the way we want to be treated. That's how God designed it. But it got corrupted. Why? Because of Cain and Abel. We see in Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother out of anger. And what for? God was the one who decided which sacrifice was right. He saw... Abel gave that righteous sacrifice and Cain gave outside of what God had commanded him to give. So instead of Cain repenting and going to God and asking for restoration, he kills his brother. And that's how sin has so desperately corrupted us that we see our own sin and we decide it's our brother's fault and we want to kill our brother. That's not just physically, that's emotionally, mentally, spiritually. We want to kill our brother. 
But what the entirety of Scripture is trying to get us back to is in right relationship with God. And when we're in right relationship with God, our relationship with our brother should be right. And that starts with treating others the way you want to be treated. Doing unto them what you want them to do to you. This encapsulates the law and prophets. This is what God is trying to get us back to. And so we must understand today that if we ever want to fulfill what Christ is wanting for us to do, if we ever want to follow the word of God, not only do we need to be in right relationship with God, we need to be in right relationship with our brother. That golden rule is still important. It's not just important for kids in school. It's important for every single one of us. And maybe we ought to think about that more. Doing to others what you want them to do to you. Because really that's what Scripture is trying to teach us. So again, point number four is Scripture supports the golden rule. And we're going to read two more verses today and then we will end this off. And so we're going to change it up a little bit. Verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And so we've been talking about how we treat our brother. And we're talking about getting a right relationship with God, getting our hearts right, getting our value system in line with God. And Jesus said all of this. And there's this point where he says, you know what, now enter by the narrow gate. Life is on the other side of the narrow gate. So point number five today is follow the narrow path. And what is the narrow path? If you've been listening to every part of this Sermon on the Mount, this is a part of that narrow path. Everything that Jesus has said is a part of that narrow path, but we understand that this is hard to do. This way that leads to life, it's difficult. It's hard sometimes. And so I've come here and I'm, I'm proclaiming the word to you and I'm trying to explain all these different concepts that Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. But guess what? I have a hard time doing these things too. I'm not perfect. I need to learn to do better. I got to go above and beyond what I'm doing now. And Jesus, he has raised the standard in this sermon He's raised the standard so that we can get our hearts right. And guess what? It's hard. It's hard. It's tough sometimes. It's hard to make the right decision. It's hard to do the right thing. Because guess what? We're flesh. We all have faults. We all have failures. We all mess up. That's all part of the fall. That's all part of our sinful nature. And so it's easy to go that wide gate, that broad way, because that's where most people are going. Just follow the crowd. Just, you know, it's not difficult. It's easy. Just take the easy way out. But when you take the easy way out, it's just going to lead to destruction. And I think this is a great reminder before we enter into the last part of this series in two weeks. I think it's important to, you know, look back and say, okay, how am I applying what Jesus has taught in this sermon? What are some areas that he talked about that I need to do better? Because you know what? It's, it's difficult. It's going to take work. That doesn't mean that your work saved you, no. But your works keep you on the path that God has laid out for you. Because guess what? This is what I believe. You have the choice whether you're going to keep going in that free 
gift of salvation that has been given to you or not. You can reject a free gift. You can reject it. But it's there. It may be narrow. It may make life difficult. But guess what? Jesus already paid the price. When Jesus died on that cross and shed his blood, he opened up the narrow gate. He opened up the straight path so that we didn't have to work for it. Because guess what? Under the law, you had to work for it. Talk about difficult. But what's funny about Jesus opening the gate, and you're like, well, what's funny about that? I mean, that's a serious thing. He opened the gate, made a free way to salvation. Well, it's kind of funny because he now raises the standard. We ought to live better because we don't have to work for it. Because now we can live to please God, not to work for our salvation. Now we, be, now we can work out our salvation in our lives. We're working out of our salvation. <laughs> He's given it to us, and now we get to walk in the path. Because guess what? We couldn't walk this path in our own power because of how difficult it is. But because he has saved us. And through that Holy Spirit that is inside of us, that God has freely given to us of his spirit, that good gift of the Holy Ghost. Because of that gift, we now have the power within us to tread that difficult path, to walk in that freely, freely open gate, even though it's narrow, even though few may go in, we understand Jesus made a way. And through the power of his spirit, we can walk that difficult path. We can do what Jesus has called us to do. Not out of working for our salvation, but out of working out of our salvation. And when we understand that today, that we ought to follow the narrow path. And guess what? We're going to walk straight through those gates. And we will be with Jesus for eternity. He that endures until the end shall be saved. If you stay on that narrow path, it may be difficult at times, but if you would just stay on the path that Jesus has laid out freely for you, you don't have to work for it. You just got to walk in it. And when you do that, you will see Jesus one day. And as we go into next week, we'll talk a little bit more about that moment. And how that should go in our lives. But for today, let's recap our five points. Number one, restoration is a gift from God. Don't waste it. Number two, you have to pursue to possess. Number three, God wants to give you good gifts. Number four, scripture supports the golden rule. And number five, follow the narrow path. Follow the narrow path today. And I hope that you leave this podcast encouraged to understand that, man, we've been going through this now for eight parts and we're going on a ninth part. And we've, listened, we've talked about all of this stuff. Man, that's hard to do. That's difficult. But God has made a way for you. He has given us his spirit through salvation so that we might be able to endure and walk that narrow path and do everything that he's laid out for us in this sermon. We can do it by the power of his spirit. And if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost today, I encourage you to find a place of prayer, repent of your sins, turn from your wicked ways, 
Have a change in your heart where you're convicted and say, God, I'm sorry for everything that I've done. Please forgive me of my sins. And help me to walk in newness of life toward you. And after you repent, you go down into the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus. Your sins will be forgiven. And guess what? It is a promise for you that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when that happens, you can walk in the way that God has ordained for you to walk. And in that, you will begin to glorify the kingdom of God and edify the body of Christ in your life through the power of the Spirit. God bless you. See you all in a couple of weeks.